Food Heals Podcast, episode 280. The mechanisms in the body are housed there to access, you know, your intuition, your third eye, and the pineal gland in the brain. I look at intuition as basically your kind of inner guidance system. So you don't have to want to be a psychic to do it. It's just, are you able to easily navigate for yourself? There's no health without mental health. It is as important as any other aspect of your physical health. Most psychiatrists see mental health is that it's the holistic view. Holistic Voice presents the Food Heals Podcast with your hosts, Alison Melody and Susie Hardy. Join the Food Heals Nation and learn the secrets to go from feeling unwell to healing yourself. Warning, side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, an increase in sexual activity, feelings of joy, cravings for kale and quinoa, and a spike in Tinder matches. In rare cases, women have experienced a strong desire to change their status update from hashtag blessed to hashtag OMG even more blessed than yesterday, hashtag loving life. If you experience any of these symptoms, make sure to tweet a Kardashian immediately. All right. Welcome, Food Heals Nation. Thanks for joining us. I'm Allison Melody. Today, we're chatting with forensic psychiatrist Samir Srivastava. Samir works at the oldest psychiatrist hospital in Europe, assessing and treating mentally disordered offenders. He's also a film producer who I met at the Cannes Film Festival, and we immediately clicked because we're both passionate about making media that matters, and we both had films in the French Riviera Film Festival. And it's going to be co-hosted by our friend with six podcasts. You know her from multiple episodes of the show, Laura Powers. But first, Food Heals Superfans, check it out. We've got exclusive new podcasts coming out just for you. The Food Heals VIP Club is live, and that means you're getting brand new episodes every single month when you become an insider at glow.fm slash foodheals. In the Food Heals VIP Club, we take you behind the scenes of your favorite wellness brands. Let me take you a little bit behind the scenes of our show for a sec. From the one-on-one guest interviews to editing to writing the show notes to sending emails to posting on social media, Food Heals takes time, effort, and resources to share with you for free every week. And I'm so humbled. I'm so grateful to all of you for being longtime listeners, for supporting our show, for really all the emails I get that say we have made a difference in your lives. Thank you. I really appreciate you. I want to help you along on this wellness journey. And I want to keep pumping out amazing curated tailored episodes for you that inform, that entertain, that inspire, that help you want to change your life and take your health into your own hands to heal yourself, mind, body, and spirit. And one way to help me do that is direct listener support. Your support helps the show grow and it helps support my green juice addiction. I'll be completely honest with you. So I set up a link where you can quickly and easily support the show and get VIP bonus episodes you'll never hear anywhere else. The whole thing takes less than 60 seconds at Glow. Dot fm slash food heals. We're asking for $5 a month, which is cheaper than a cup of coffee, cheaper than a green juice. Contribute more if you'd like. And if Food Heals is an important part of your day or your week and you love what we're doing and you want some more, please check out glow.fm slash food heals and support us in any way you can today. I'm super grateful for you. Thank you so much for being a Food Heals listener. Next up, our interview with Samir, co-hosted by Laura Powers. The Food Heals Podcast starts now. He's a forensic psychiatrist, producer, and wellness advocate. Please welcome today's guest, Samir. Hi, Ali. Great to be here. So glad to have you. And our co-host today, you remember from multiple episodes of Food Heals, she's a psychic, a writer, an actress, a model, producer, singer, speaker, and podcaster, basically all the things. Please welcome Laura. Thanks so much for having me back. So glad to have you back. So we have a little Cannes reunion going on here, guys. I know. I love it. <laughs> so we all met in Cannes. Well, I met Laura before Cannes, but you, We spent time We spent time in Cannes, <laughs> yes, for the Cannes Film Festival. So let's just, let's catch up. What, what yeah, were you there yeah, for? Yeah, we went, last time I saw you, we were dancing together with Martinez. Yes. <laughs> Me, Laura, and some other friends that I'd met from the uh, film festival, French Riviera Film Festival, mm-hmm. where I had a film and you guys came to, who those guys had also... Um, done a great film called tumble dry yes so yes. we're all together that, that was, was a really nice so much fun. really really nice evening yeah 
What a blast. It's one of the best festival and out of the country experiences I've ever had. That's fantastic. It was your first time in Cannes? Yeah, my first time in France. First time in France. Uh It was so fun. And as I was saying before, I remember seeing you on a panel where you were just about to talk about everything Uh uh, in in terms of food heals. So that was fantastic that you were able to go and do that in Cannes, I think. Yeah, I mean, if they'll have me back, I'll go every year. It was such a great (laughs) experience. Yeah, and it was interesting. You know, all the people we met there, and I did meet a lot of people in health and wellness, and I was pleasantly surprised yeah and i've been going to Cannes for about four five years now wow. and i'd never seen a segment looking at health and wellness in that detail yeah and so before we get into forensic psychiatry and what you do can you tell me a little about your filmmaking career and what what, what were you in Cannes for all that good stuff Sure. So my best friend is also a doctor. He's an ENT surgeon. And we both met as junior doctors in 2006, where we're doing our general rotations. And he decided that he actually really wanted to be a director. And he's from India and he grew up in India. And like myself, who was born and brought in the UK with Indian parents. And he decided, I want to be a a filmmaker I'm going to go and do um, a film diploma at the London Film School Mm -hmm. so he left training the medical training and he went and did a year and got his diploma and because we're such good friends every time he had a project he would talk to me about it and I would end up um, working on aspects of the story and the script with him Mm -hmm. but as a a friend so totally outside of what you did day to day totally outside of what I was doing day to day and uh, I enjoyed it so much and he felt that I've got a, a talent to be involved and really invited me to collaborate and be his partner in the work that we do and we produced um, about three short films now together and he has produced more through his film school and now we're working and looking for a feature film script but in Cannes we were basically at the French Riviera Film Festival Mm -hmm. which was fantastic because we were in the final final section of the comedy category and that's where I met Laura who was one of the judges for the uh, the horror category I know I I didn't judge that category they didn't let her judge our (laughs) fault at least mine because they knew we knew knew each other yeah yeah. (laughs) because I was like Laura did you vote for me she's like I don't judge (laughs) so yeah so I I, it's great for me because I have an extremely intense job with what I do in my day-to-day life and it gives me the ability to be creative and actually when I was growing up I was much better at the art subjects than I was mm. at science Preaching and my natural choir, baby. <laughs> yeah it gives me a this beautiful creative freedom to create something which I would uh, I would recommend to anyone and everyone is to be involved with something creative. I think it's great for your well-being. Well, I love how that just like fell in your lap and and you didn't even strive for it. You know, most people work. I was pure luck. Yeah. <laughs> that my friends actually had this dream and then actually I was such good friends and uh, invited me to join him and then it kind of grew within me as well. That's so cool. So yeah. are you going to bring a film to Cannes next year? I would love to, but yeah. getting a film into Cannes is one of the most prestigious festivals in the world, as you know, so it's difficult. I was lucky because the French Riviera Film Festival is a small new festival that ran at the same time as Cannes. So being in Cannes allowed us to be there as well, which is fantastic. Best thing. I mean, that was so much fun. And it was amazing. What was your film at the festival? Powered by Plants. It was the last film in the entire documentary category, which was the last category of the entire film festival. So I got to sit through everyone else as nervous as hell when mine was going to play and then it finally played and I was finally I was like oh I can breathe now it's over and it was so great it was (laughs) so great so just because I know a little bit about Samir and his background I think it's important to talk about for everyone listening that I feel like you can have many different strengths and many things that you're good at and so often in our society we're kind of taught we need to like choose one thing or only be good at one thing and you know Samir is a great filmmaker you know he's a forensic psychiatrist and he's also an amazing singer and songwriter so that's really Oh, oh, because we're supposed to go to karaoke while you're in town. Yes. I feared I might be going to a karaoke with these two amazingly gifted ladies. And Definitely I'll have to, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll very much enjoy that. Laura's going to take you to our new favorite place that I took her to a couple of weeks ago when she was in town. Oh, it was fabulous. Yeah. I think no other karaoke place has lived up or is going to live up to that. I know. So good. Well, the mics are so good. So you yeah. sound like Madonna. You're just like, I'm amazing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where other places you're like, God, I can't but sing. I, yeah. I think you're pretty impressive, Ali, as well. I mean, I know Laura's impressive because oh, I've, so I've, I've heard I've heard that you're up there as well. You know, you've well, got a potential other career in the making. Oh, thank you. Well, Laura and I have have determined that Laura's old Hollywood and I'm new Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Awesome. Well, take us back through because I know, you know, mental health is something that we talk about a lot on this podcast and I think it's very overlooked 
many times when we are trying to get to the bottom of a health or wellness issue. And so you're a fi- forensic psychiatrist. And when I hear that, I think of like CSI because of the forensic thing. And when I hear a psychiatrist, I think someone prescribes pills. And that's not exactly what you do. So can you take us through that and why mental health is a passion of yours? Absolutely. There's the Royal College of Psychiatrists say in the UK there, um, catchphrase you could say or their one of their logos and their sentiments I would say on the catchphrase or logo is there's no health without mental health what that means is it is as important as any other aspect of your physical health Mm -hmm. for your well-being and that the way that I see it and the way that most psychiatrists see mental health is that it's the holistic view which I think you also promote in talking about food and health, which is something I believe in. So it's a holistic view. And um, we talk about a, a psycho, biopsychosocial model, which is the biological aspect, the psychological aspect, and the social aspect. And they're three components that can lead to mental disorder or unwellness, you could say. So the biological aspect looks at the body and chemicals, psychological is how someone is potentially coping with something mm-hmm. and social stresses from the social aspects which can be any anything that happens in someone's life from the loss of a family member and everybody has different thresholds with how they can cope with that which then can lead to illness if not picked up and understood fully yeah so it really is a holistic view about someone's well-being I love that. I feel like psychiatry in the UK is very different from the psychiatry in the US that I'm accustomed to, it sounds like. I don't know too much about the differences, um, but what I can do is tell you about how psychiatry is in the UK. What forensis means in Latin, it means legal in court. And forensic, what it means to us is someone that has not always convictions in terms of offending, but offending behaviours that are related to their disorder. So a lot of the people that we treat have behaviours associated with their condition that can lead them to coming into contact with the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, the people that we are treating, it's after something has happened. And before that, we have a structure called general adult psychiatry, which is for everyone between the ages of 18 and 65. If someone is taken into secondary healthcare services, you're under the care of the general adult psychiatrists. Primary care is the same as what we call family medicine here. And we call them general practice in the UK. Um, and as I say, there's normally some event or something that's happened while someone is under the care of general adult psychiatry that's been quite risky. Like a trauma? Something, it, it could be a trauma, but normally it's some risk. So when you're talking about forensic psychiatry, it's a risk to someone else. So for example, if some if there's a risk presenting to someone themselves and they're self-harming, okay. uh, which can be common in certain conditions, that can be treated within general adult psychiatry. But if it's a risk that is affecting other people that needs to be managed, then we're the specialists we're looking at managing that risk to other people. Okay. That can be serious violence, multiple murders, arsons, setting fires, sex offending or sex offences of varying degrees. Sometimes it can be acquisitive offending, which is stealing or burglary, but there normally has to be some link with a mental disorder. Okay. So you're working with the people who are at that level now. That's right. That's my specialist field, forensic psychiatry. You mentioned something before that I think is important about the image that you have in your mind when you hear psychiatrist, which is about giving pills. Mm -hmm. And it's a little sad to hear that. I think that psychiatry all starts from how you humanly interact with someone. And just by giving someone time, you can help them incredibly just listening to someone yeah and that's the absolute truth sometimes i don't even have to talk to help someone i am someone who generally or genuinely likes spending time with people and if you do then psychiatry is a great thing because you can be touched by someone who's in a position of your needs by the things that they can bring to that conversation Mm -hmm. I think one of the things in the United States, and I'm still learning more about the healthcare system in the United States, but it's very common to spend a long time in a lobby and then go into, say, a general practitioner, you know, medical doctor's office and, and literally have like five minutes mm-hmm. with the doctor. Whereas in psychiatry, it sounds like they're generally speaking is more time spent. Would you say that's a fair statement? That's a very fair statement. I think in the UK, the general practitioners are under a lot of pressure with time. They have pretty much 10 minutes per appointment with a patient. And that's a lot of pressure. And 
I think what has happened is that they don't always have the time to sit and listen through everything. And sometimes it's absolutely justified that someone might need an antidepressant, say a, an SSRI, which is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So things you'll have heard of like fluoxetine or trade name Prozac. And sometimes it may not be the immediate answer to that particular situational problem. Like I said about the biopsychosocial model, Normally, it could be a social stressor yeah. that everyone is going through. But for some reason, that person's stress tolerance threshold at that particular time is quite low. There's so many factors to it. I believe that even if medication is prescribed, talking therapies are a big aspect of helping the individual and the patient because it's almost like a plaster mm -hmm. on a deep wound. You might cover the wound, but underneath you haven't dealt with whatever trauma you mentioned trauma is going on in that person's life. The GPs, family doctors, they don't have the luxury of time that we do. But that's one reason why I chose psychiatry because yeah. I knew I needed more time with people because my parents were GPs and I saw how they managed so many situations. But I just realized that that wasn't quite for me, yeah. even though I've got the greatest respect for mm -hmm. what they do with all types of problems and not just psychiatric conditions that they deal with. All right, if you are enjoying this conversation with Samir and Laura, be sure to check out the Food Heals VIP Club because in our next exclusive interview, we've got Laura and Samir back for more, where we're going behind the scenes of their lives and businesses to chat about filmmaking, podcasting, and living that. All right, if you are enjoying this conversation with Samir and Laura, be sure to check out the Food Heals VIP Club because in our next exclusive interview, we've got Laura and Samir back for more, where we're going behind the scenes of their lives and businesses to chat about filmmaking, podcasting, and living that laptop lifestyle, that travel life. It's all at glow.fm slash food heals. Check it out. We've also got some amazing episodes already in the club, like the power of podcasting and becoming an entrepreneur on fire with Kate Erickson. We've got how to create a thriving health coaching business with Avita Rampart. And we've got building a blogging business and writing books with the queen of future boards, Sarah Centrella. Those are all live right now and available as soon as you sign up. Those bonus episodes never heard anywhere else. And we've got some really exciting brand new content coming up in November. We've got the most powerful tool to overcome overwhelm and design a life that you love with Lisa Thomas, my personal counselor and DNA healer, who you know from multiple episodes of Food Heals. We're also talking to Daisy Jing from Banish about how to turn your passion into a product and how she built her organic skincare business. So much more coming up over the next few months for less than a cup of coffee. You can get insider access to the Food Heals VIP Club. Again, that's glow.fm slash food heals. That's the link. And your support helps us grow. It helps us pump out more food heals content for you and supports my green juice addiction. Thanks so much for your support. And thanks for listening. Now back to my interview with Samir and Laura. You're listening to the Food Heals Podcast. Make sure to subscribe, rate and review us on iTunes. I wonder if you know anything about this or if you found this in your practice. There was a study done. It's called the ACE score. ACEs, A-C-E-S, Adverse Childhood Experience Score. And what it does is it looks at everything that's happened to you um, from your birth and throughout your childhood. And the amount of trauma you have can determine certain factors based on stats. It doesn't necessarily mean you're destined for this, but the statistics show that if you have a certain number of adverse childhood experiences, that's when you end up in the criminal justice system and things like that. Is that something that you found in your practice? or can you speak to anything like that? I think absolutely. When I think about cases and demographics of patients that I see, they've had quite significant traumas throughout their childhood mm -hmm. that have shaped their thinking and their way of life. And they haven't had the opportunities or even a stable family background right. where offending might be a natural part of their upbringing mm -hmm. because they've been introduced mm -hmm. into criminogenic environments quite early on in their life. Mm -hmm. And they really didn't get a choice to think when right. they were young. And so when I hear some of their stories, you can't even blame them for the choices they've made. You have so much compassion, right? That's the reality. Yeah. I wouldn't even say it's compassion. When you look through their histories, you were able to see what I've seen. You would see that the trajectory of their life, some might say you could predict that 
people would end up in the, say, correctional institutions and they'd follow that path and that trajectory. But I think that where we come in, if there's a mental illness associated with that or a mental disorder that even develops after they came into the criminal justice system, mm. we then are able to treat that, but also to try and guide them with decision making yeah. for the future, which is something I really try. I get a lot out of trying to do that, you know, but I think there are factors that can lead someone to be able to predict how someone's going to make choices later on in their life and, you know, traumas and experiences that anyone feels in their childhood it has a huge impact on their social development in their later out of life yeah especially if we don't deal with those traumas because usually and generally we're not taught those skills of how to deal with trauma i didn't know there were stages of grief when i was losing my parents i had no idea i just pushed it all down i didn't have any tools luckily i discovered those tools and i went on this path of holistic health and wellness and discovery but for the people that don't become lucky enough to somehow discover it or it's put in front of them, then yeah, the path that they go on can, you know, get quite dark. I know you're also really passionate about prevention. Can you talk about that? How can we prevent mental health issues from affecting us? I think one of the things that you're talking about and you're promoting about diets and your food intake of diet and your energy and the type of energy and the type of calories you're taking in is extremely important. Prevention is better than cure. Again, it's something that all doctors understand and that's what the promotion should be for everybody from every aspect. Lifestyle, how you live your life. Even myself, I work sometimes very late hours, I don't get enough sleep and I feel it. And it affects my decision making, my ability to handle stresses, deal with emotions, and I feel it within myself. And so sleep is extremely important. It can't be underestimated how important sleep is. Some people are lucky enough to have their families in their lives and real good social supports within their life. Um, some people aren't as lucky, but having people in your life, even if it's one person, mm. one friend that you can really talk to yeah. about what's going on when you have a problem is extremely important. You know, there's so many different factors to someone's lifestyle, but I think lifestyle, how you live your life is so important to preventing not just physical health conditions, mental health conditions, everything. And I think food's an hugely important part of that. And I think Laura has taught me a lot about food, incredible mm -hmm. amount about food, even though I'm a doctor, I'm yeah. always learning. <laughs> I'm, I'm always learning. And I think someone's biochemistry is very unique to them and not all foods will give someone the same level of energy or effect as other people. But in general, the dietary guidelines that I'd love to know more about your teachings and, and what you're promoting. In general, a lot of them are very good in terms of, you know, staying away from the things that you know are bad for you and high amounts of sugar, and high amounts of fat and, you know, good protein. And, and so I just think food is extremely important as well as exercise, lifestyle, sleep, social contacts, being able to explain when things aren't going so well for you and trying to do that early on yeah. rather than letting something become something that's really affecting you. Yeah, being able to speak your truth is as important as eating the right foods. You know what I mean? It's a part of suppressing and holding on to past things. And when we let that go and we're in our truth, it's like we're powerful. And then we can digest the food better. You know, it all works together. And I'm with you guys. You know, my whole thing is just about go to functional medicine testing doctor. Get your food allergies tested. Find out what nutrients you're deficient in. And then you know the perfect diet for you. If you're reading a book and it's called the Florida Beach Diet, let's say, and it tells you here's what you're going to eat, it's bullshit because every single person has different genetics they have different blood types they have different upbringings they have different minerals in their soil than you have in a different state in a different country find out what works for you discover your food allergies you can create the perfect diet for your body mine is not the same as samir's is not the same as laura's and it's like it's not rocket science but if anyone tells you there's one diet for everyone I, I totally agree with that. They're full of it. <laughs> I agree. And it, it's even not just one diet for everyone, but a diet for you at a particular time. Because sure. you can, you have whatever your genetic predispositions are, and then you have whatever is maybe medically going on in your body. Yeah. So there have been times when I would eat a certain thing, and then later that very same food that felt amazing at that one time mm -hmm. suddenly didn't feel good anymore. So I think we have to be really careful about that prescriptive thinking yeah. for food and pay attention to our bodies. And I think it's important to just try different things and see. And if it doesn't resonate for you, don't 
put too much stock in it. Yeah, and you'll start to get to know your body. Your body will tell you, nope, like yep. sugar, <laughs> nope. Yeah. <laughs> Dairy for me, no. Nope. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but your body will tell you. And once you start becoming aware, then you start listening to those cues and you start making the connections. And I think a food journal can be really helpful. If you can't tell, you're like, oh, I don't feel good, but I don't know why. Food journaling will tell you. You'll figure it out. You'll be like, oh, every time I get this stomach pain, it's because, oh, I ate that one burrito that has all the cheese in it or whatever, you know? Yeah, and we were just talking about this last night. While there's variety in certain things that people handle, there's some things that I think almost no one should probably eat in any quantity What's or large quantity, list, like corn syrup, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for example. Yeah. I just think canola oil, mm-hmm. which is sadly oh God, used so much. Yeah. yeah, and I would say GMOs, which unfortunately yeah. are tough to avoid. It's been very nice in the UK because they're banned. And Although I understand that there's some discussion of opening that back up. Is that what you've heard, no, Samir? No. Well, there's things that are happening in the UK, discussions about foods that I think you might have picked up a statement that Boris Johnson, our new UK Prime Minister, has said, talking about GMOs. He's hilarious. Yeah, but he also did something that was great, which in my view was introduce a sugar tax. Yeah. So companies that were putting a high amount of sugar into certain products were being taxed Mm -hmm. over a certain amount. And then there was some discussion recently about not maybe having an evidence base correlated with people losing weight and whether that should stay or not. But I think it was a great thing. But yeah, it's interesting how developments can happen within politics Mm -hmm. as well. You know, so you always question whether it's the politics in order to raise votes or if it doesn't always appear to be coherent with what's actually happening with the research at the time. But the one thing that I do think was which is very good was the sugar tax. I don't know if they have something like that in the States, do they? In California, they do. They they had a soda tax for a while. I don't know if it's still in existence. I don't know. But it's not something like nationally, like in the UK at all. I think we... We have alcohol and tobacco to, are the two yeah. closest things. But unfortunately, sugar, I think, is largely intact. I mean, I, I mean, I do believe to some degree that adults should have the right to choose. But I think where it really means most to me is when companies, for example, are aiming products at children. Right. Who have... No awareness. No, no awareness and control, if allowed. They right. will eat sugar. And particularly, for example, things like cereal, where you can put a lot, large amount of sugar in certain mm-hmm. cereals and you wouldn't really know. I mean, they can taste sweet, but a, the child's not going to know that these cinnamon toasties yeah. have got this amount of sugar and the damage. Or like, even like green goddess salad dressing. You're like, oh, this is healthy. Second ingredient, sugar. Yeah. It's like, you know, they're putting there sugar in everything. Hot so, sauce. E- exactly. Ketchup. You think you're doing something healthy and it turns out the second ingredient is sugar on so many things and they're subsidizing it and they're making it cheaper to eat worse. So people, low income families are forced, even if they're more educated and they know better, they literally can't eat better because the only thing at their grocery store or at their gas station is sugar number two, you know? So if I can just chime in to say one thing that I th- found so interesting, I, I got this information from my guides talking about Lord's production. Like, in case we forgot. Yes, yes. So her guides are telling her something <laughs> to say guides. now. Uh, talking about how something is produced very much has information about how it is in our body. So both sugar and tobacco, for example, are very difficult to grow and frequently there would be pesticides and various things used to make that happen. But one of the large drivers behind slavery in the United States was the growth of those two crops. Yeah. So anytime there's something that is bad for humanity and people and has a lot of pain and suffering involved, it's also going to be bad for our body. Yeah, I mean, think about factory farming and slaughtering of the animals. Right. They're suffering. Do you think that suffering doesn't affect you? I believe it does. Laura, what do your guides say about wine? Maybe don't tell me. But that's the one thing I can't give Ooh, up people. Okay, so... <laughs> Alcohol as a whole is something that I feel should definitely be used in moderation. It damages the brain and the liver and the gut. So I think it's something that a lot of people use socially. And I have certainly done that. I used to be actually quite a heavy drinker. And it was a time when I was healing through a lot of pain from divorce and, you know, just some tough things that I was dealing with. So I totally understand, you know, using it and the desire to have it. I think it's definitely something that's best to be used in moderation. And with wine, I'm learning more and more specifically how wine can be very toxic because of all the things that are added to it. So sulfites, which is preservatives. A lot of people can, for example, drink wine in France or in Europe and not going to have the same reaction they do in the United States because they don't have sulfites or as many sulfites. The other thing is I read a study where arsenic was found in almost all All California California wines. I stopped drinking California wine. I only drink French and Italian now. And then a lot of people also aren't aware of this, but for wines in particular, there is a lot of sugar added. So I think a lot of people assume that 
that it's just the sweetness of the grape. It's not. So you, by the time you add alcohol, which by the way is a known carcinogen, a lot of people don't know that. And then you add the sugar and you add the arsenic and you add the sulfites. That's a lot of tough stuff on your body to be handling. And when you're consuming something like that, if you're not consuming it and giving your body time to heal, it's going to have a compound cumulative effect on your ability to clear toxins, for example, with the liver, think critically with your brain. Yeah. So I guess that's just something I think everyone has to make that decision for themselves, but it's just to go into that with your eyes open about all the different things that can affect your, your health and your mindset, motivation, drive, ability to handle toxins, et cetera. And intuition, because by the way, your gut and the brain are the mechanisms in the body are housed there to access, you know, your intuition, your third eye and the pineal gland in the brain, and then your gut feeling, um, you know, in your digestive system. So anything that negatively physically impacts those two areas is going to have a negative impact on your ability to intuit for yourself. And I look at intuition as basically your kind of inner guidance system. So you don't have to want to be a psychic to do it. It's just, are you able to like easily navigate for yourself? And, and tap into that mm-hmm. and know when it's your intuition versus like your thinking brain going, do this, do that. Exactly. So having, say, a lot of wine, <laughs> I <laughs> think would damage. No, that? no, could just because you asked me the question. <laughs> and by the way, I mean, just being completely honest and forthright here, I used to be a heavy drinker. I would not say that I was an alcoholic or anything, but I would sometimes drink like eight to 10 drinks in a night. I mean, that's a lot. So I completely understand yeah. doing that, but I don't drink any anymore. I respect that. We can still hang. We still do all the yes, parties together yes. and you allow and me I, my glass of yes, wine. Yes, and I don't, I don't judge, you know, yeah. if, if you are. <laughs> How does alcohol fit into your philosophy of health promotion, food promotion? I guess for me, because I do everything so clean, I mean, I eat soups, smoothies, and salads all day. I don't put anything bad into my body. I recently went, I want to say sugar-free, but sugar light, because there's some things that you just consume that have sugar in them. But I stopped eating dessert, which was huge for me. And so that's why I feel justified in having one to three glasses of wine when I feel like it, (laughs) especially at events like Cannes and where we're celebrating, because it brings me from introversion status to extroversion status. And I think it's just celebratory and I love that. But I do try to only do organic, vegan, and now I'm trying to do French and Italian. I think that's great. It's paying attention to all those things and and also just paying attention to your body because there's a period of time where it did feel fine to drink. And then my body just basically was like, nope. Yeah. And then (laughs) I had to listen. Yeah. And so just pay attention to what your body is telling you. If I was less clean, I probably wouldn't be able to handle it. But I'm so clean that I think, and I could be wrong, Laura, you can tell me, but um, (laughs) I think my moderation is on point, except every once in a while, you know? But then I do cleanses, so I cleanse it all out. Since we're talking about you know, now alcohol, wine, a substance. I'm curious, Samir, if you can share with us your thoughts on substances and how they impact mental health. Well, uh, substances, um, when we think of substances, we think of illicit drugs. Yeah. Um, anything from marijuana to heroin and everything in between. And also we think of alcohol. Alcohol is a substance, so when we take psychiatric history, we also look at the alcohol history and how much someone consumes a day. Because not taken with moderation, or if someone can't even handle one or two drinks, which is allowed within the daily limits, I suppose. I'm not sure if it varies between countries, but again, it's that threshold. Then it can lead to psychological problems. For sure. But that in itself doesn't say it doesn't mean that alcohol is you know, the worst thing in the world. When we think about substances and how it impacts on people's mental health, when you, again, you look at the histories, there is there is a link between mental disorders and certain substances. Mm-hmm. And there's been shown to be a link between, for example, young people, especially within their teens and before the age of about 20, that have smoked a lot of cannabis. Mm-hmm. Not maybe just a few joints, but a lot of cannabis. And it can affect the development of the brain and the neurons. I think some quite eminent professors in the UK, I wouldn't say some, I can think of one who was advising the government, said there's no evidence, and he eventually got sacked by the government. My view is I've actually seen the moment that their lives changed due to cannabis, for example. Yeah. So taking all the different research arguments aside, I've seen a whole number of people that have been affected by it and how their lives could have been if they hadn't unfortunately uh, got in you know some had promising careers and then they got into smoking cannabis Mm -hmm. and not only did it demotivate them as a first problem demotivation before the development of any actual psychiatric disorder but then they developed psychiatric disorder so it demotivated them from what they're 
goal was. And then they unfortunately they developed this psychiatric disorder that needed secondary care hospital treatment and has completely uh, affected their life. I mean, there's a number of other substances as well, but I think there it's an issue within psychiatry, substance use. Do you think that with cannabis that it is something that can be healing for some and can be detrimental to others? Because, you know, there's so much research on the other side of it where it helps people with social anxiety, it helps cancer patients, all that kind of stuff. Do you think that it depends on the person just like we were talking about? Or do you think it's more detrimental than helpful? Uh, well, I think different things affect different people differently. And culturally, there's cultures that smoke cannabis and it's actual spiritual. It's mm-hmm. part of their yeah. uh, Rastafarianism. Some people get great health benefits from it, from research that's been done in MS and certain conditions. So it may have its, you know, CBD oil is coming out in a big way oh, yeah. as well. CBD is everywhere. So I think there's particular strains. I totally go back to what you said. Different substances affect different people differently. And you really need to be aware early, especially with substances. Yeah how it's going to affect you because becoming legalized in America in three different states now and probably more in Canada is probably going to be the trend is it's going to be legalized more but I would just say to anyone is that just be very very aware on how a substance affects you whether it's alcohol to cannabis to anything and be very receptive to how that's that's affecting you and look after yourself you are the best judgment of how something is affecting you People might comment on it, but you can't. We have so many therapies that help people with substance misuse and they go to classes when they're in secure hospitals because we know that those are the things that will make them unwell in the community when they're discharged. But if they don't want to change or they they don't have the insight to understand it's bad for them, it doesn't matter how many classes they're going to go through, they're not going to change. So it really is about the individual understanding what the impact is on them, whatever substance that might be. Absolutely. And I know like our listeners are listening right now. We are the warriors that want to change, that want to be aware. Maybe Laura can chime in and tell us like, okay, how are some ways that we can know how to trust our intuition to understand how something is affecting us for the best or for the worst? Yeah. And I want to jump in and just say whether it's cannabis or wine or other types of alcohol or whatever, that it's very different now than it was for our parents or our grandparents. So what was fine or was handled in a certain way may not be the case now because for example, cannabis has been bred to be much stronger than it was for, let's say, our parents or our grandparents. And now with wines, there's adding all these other things. Right. So just something to keep in mind in terms of, you Make know, it even... yourself. Grow it yourself. People. Well, yeah. Just and just, just because legal. <laughs> I hear this, like, people have been drinking wine or people have been eating bread since the Bible. I'm like, yeah, but oh, it's not... all the people not... that used to drink when they were pregnant, I was like, I bet it was not full of all this shit that is uh, Right, you know, exactly. It's now. different. Not that I'm, I'm saying they should have drinking wine. I'm just saying. No, but, but it, it does make a difference. Yeah. And in terms of how to how to know, I think the first thing is just to really pay attention to your body. You, you said doing a food journal. I've actually never done it that structured, but I just literally would just pay attention to how I ate or how I felt, excuse me, after I ate or drank something and then just started to notice patterns and start to eliminate the things that you know for sure. So yeah. eliminate sugar. For me, wheat was a big one. Yeah. Like A lot of people do. No matter what, organic, whatever, non-GMO, doesn't seem to matter. If I eat wheat, I just feel terrible. Then you limit the bigger things that you know, and then um, as your body adjusts to that, then you'll start to be able to determine some of the other things that are specific triggers for you as well. I think that's a very important point about cannabis as well. I think in the UK, which is also here, the genetically grown cannabis, man-made cross strains of skunk have the highest potency of THC, and that particularly uh, can cause psychosis. Wow. So skunk is a, that's the most potent type that wants to be most careful with. Is that the street term, skunk? Skunk. <laughs> I think in the UK. I know it's not an American term. It's not an American term. I can't think what the American term might be over here, but hydroponically grown cannabis. Oh, okay, gotcha. So that's no no good. Well, that is, that's got the highest percentage of THC. Which is the hallucinogenic yeah, part or which one of can result in someone having sensory perceptual abnormalities and and very intense ones. I'm so glad I don't like this. Just a side note for people that are psychic slash intuitive, you know, sensitive, intuitively, etc., is that a lot of those people in my experience do not react well to THC in particular. There are, for example, CBD isolates, which don't have THC, or, you know, you can have certain ones where they have specifically processed or created it with low THC. And if you are one of those folks that is intuitive slash psychic, you might want to explore that because I think everyone can have a sensitivity to that. But 
I know it's like for himself, I, anything that has a substantial amount of THC, I'm going to react poorly to. Yeah. Um, well, I am a fan of CBD and Susie, who's one of my co-hosts, who's not here today, makes the best brand, the purest brand, CBDfountain.com. And I really, really believe in her products, but it's not a THC product. What is that product and how does it help people? It helps with all kinds of things. I would have to have her speak to it. But literally, she has stories of people who, you know, kids having seizures stop in its tracks just by adding CBD, like just crazy stories. And a lot of people, it helps with anxiety, depression and things like that. So I'm a I'm a proponent of that. But again, you have to trust your body. You have to trust your intuition because not everything is for everybody and nothing is a cure all. You know, all those articles online about apple cider vinegar cures everything. And it's like. I think it helps with a lot of things, but I don't think it's a cure-all for every fucking disease and every cut and scrape you ever had. Or celery juice is the big one right now. Yeah, I I think you really have to be careful with anything Okay, let's talk about that because he's a medium. (laughs) So are you going to go against the medical medium? Oh, boy. Okay. (laughs) All right. So... Here's my thought on him. I believe his name is Anthony Anthony Williams. Yeah. So there's some things that he talks about that I think have some validity, but I also think that he is giving a lot of just, here's this one thing that works for everyone kind of messaging that I don't agree with. And I don't believe that his guide is actually a a purely light guide that he communicates. So, So, and I think it's important for everyone to just take anything with a grain of salt. And if you look at, for example, the reviews for his books, you'll have a lot of people that say, this is amazing. I've had amazing results. And I'm so happy for those people, by the way. Me too, but maybe they've never juiced before. Well, but also then you have, there are people that you read and and they're like, I tried all this and I just got sicker and sicker. And, you know, so again, it's not a one size fits all approach. But celery juice sales have hit the roof. I mean, you go to Whole Foods, they're they're just juicing celery all night long. Again, you know, (laughs) try and see how you feel. But I, one of the things I see a lot in the sort of wellness community that I think is a little toxic is, oh, you're just detoxing, kind of push through it, you'll feel better. And sometimes that's the case where you are doing something that's causing a detox reaction in your body and maybe you might feel worse before you feel better. Yeah. But a lot of times you're just doing something your body just doesn't like. Mm-hmm. And so it's important to pay attention to that and not push through something just because people are telling you that this is the, the best thing for your health. Yeah, and no one to stop. I know, because I do cleanses a lot. I go seven day minimum. And what happens is by Thursday, I'm like, I feel awful. And then by Friday, I feel amazing. Brain clarity, all the things. So I know when I get over that hump that I'm amazing. But if I didn't get over that hump, I would quit. Can you tell me what you mean by cleansing? So what I do is juice and soup cleansing. So I will make vegetable juice. Sometimes I'll do a little fruit in the morning, but only veggies throughout the day because the fruit does have sugar, but it's like a healthy sugar, but it gives you a little energy. And then by the end of the day, you're only doing veggies. And then you end with like a vegetable soup, just a broth, usually raw. Sometimes I'll do cooked only in the winter. In the summer, I do raw. And at the same time, you're taking a lot of supplements that are helping detox the liver, detox the gallbladder, that type of thing. And then you're also doing colonics, which is a whole nother thing where they're basically sucking out your colon (laughs) and you cleanse your body you detox very quickly and I've never felt so good in my life doing it so it's a practice that I do kind of quarterly but also when needed like okay I just came back from this vacation and you know I didn't sleep well I ate too many foods or drank too much alcohol then I'll do it because it brings my body back into balance and I love detoxing I'm a huge proponent because our bodies have the ability to detox that's what they're made to do but we are bombarded with toxins on a regular basis and if you're not eating well already if you're living the typical standard American diet eating McDonald's every day boy do you need to detox because your body is ill-equipped to handle all of the things plus the things we can't control environmental factors why you know, I don't know how that's affecting me. I've heard and kind of scary. And in regards to the detox, yes, there's a point which you sometimes you can move past and then you will experience some benefits and release. But I'm talking about, okay, I've been trying something for a year or two years. So that's some of the people that have maybe tried a certain diet or something. And it's like, they just get worse and worse. You know, that's at some point where your body is saying like, no, this isn't for me. Just a question, really, when you talk about the American diet, and people still eat a lot of fast food. Are there any studies or any research to show trends in eating in the US at the moment and how people might be? Because I also, when I think about Americans and their diets, I feel that there's, there's a lot of awareness, awareness about, about diets, diets over here. Keep in, in mind, you're in California. You're in California. <laughs> Go to the middle of the so country that's, or that's the why south. I'm asking the question because 
In California, people are much more aware, but in other parts of the country, it's still... Completely. So I'm from North Carolina, and when I moved to California, my eyes were completely open. We had no awareness of health where I was. It's gotten better, for sure. But literally, small town America, couple doctors in the town, doctors were God, no holistic health, no yoga, no green juice, nothing like that. I moved to California, I crossed the border, and they stopped my car, and they strapped a yoga mat on my back and put a green juice in my hand, and they said, go to California. And I was like, okay. I mean, I'm joking, but the point is, is that it was a completely different different world. And although it is changing, there's lots of documentaries now and lots of people online doing the research and showing like Dr. Michael Greger, Joe Cross, all the guys behind films like What the Health that are showing, you know, the statistics and what was the sugar documentary with all the stats about sugar? Um, It's escaping me right now. I'll think of it. But anyways, that sugar film. That's one. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's the other one with Katie Couric. Oh, I forget what it's called. But there's great stats in that one about obesity. And uh, there's a lot of political stuff, too, about how Let's Move was originally the Michelle Obama initiative that was originally to get kids off of fast food and sugar and into exercise. Basically, the whole thing got squashed and only became about exercise because all of the sugar companies lobbied and they said, you know, this is unacceptable and it disappeared. Right. But I think your question was about, like, what are the statistics? They are bad. I don't know them off the top of my head. Not necessarily. Certainly, but if there's you know awareness of trends, I think you've pretty much answered my question. Yeah, big cities, there's more awareness. Now, because when I was in North Carolina, there wasn't Netflix, there wasn't YouTube, there wasn't Instagram, there wasn't Facebook, there wasn't this information at your fingertips. And so I do believe that now, even if you're in a small town, you have access to the information. Are you seeking it, right? I was seeking it and I did not have it. Then I moved to California and I found it. Now, if you're in a small town or the Midwest or you know somewhere that's not like California, New York, Chicago, go on the cutting edge of things, then you're not going to be aware of it in basic conversation with your friends because it's just not like a topic of conversation. So you have to seek it and you will find it on the internet or wherever you look. You know, these things are trending topics now, but they weren't back then. So I think it's awareness of the health and wellness movement and a holistic perspective of health is growing quickly, but it's not widespread yet. And it's also about what's available where you are. I mean, depending on where you are in the United States, your access to healthy food may be quite limited. And even in uh, California, yeah, there's food deserts all, you know, absolutely 20 miles away is a food desert. And I have like 14 whole foods in five minutes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I was just going to ask that I know you're vegan, Ali, and I follow Hindu faith and not all Hindus follow this, but there's a fast that I do on a Tuesday and Saturday where I don't eat meat. Nice. And I find it quite difficult when I'm working, especially in the UK. Again, it may not, it it may just be my access to certain places, but it's on the whole, it's not as easy to meet that need or meet the, the vegan diet need. And I wonder how you find that over here. Any recommendations you could make? I live in West Hollywood where there's like a vegan restaurant on every block. So I'm good. But for everyone else, it's like, okay, going to the restaurant and putting together the meal from the various toppings that I find. So if I'm at a restaurant that literally has no options for me, um, I'll be like, okay, let me take the tomato from here, the asparagus from the side of the steak, you know, and then I'll put together my own little meal. And they're usually very accommodating. So that's what I've basically trained myself to do. I did a road trip across South Dakota. And I think there oh, was- Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I think there, in all, all of South Dakota, there was one vegan restaurant at the time and it wasn't on our trip at all. It was very far away. So I just had to kind of make it up as- as I went along, luckily I wasn't gluten free, so I would just like take a piece of bread and slap all the veggies on, and that would be my meal. And it would be not my ideal meal, but it would be satisfying enough to get me through it. But that's not how I recommend people living. That was just through travel and everything. But bringing your own food is what I would do whenever possible because you can grocery shop, you can plan in advance, and then you can make amazing, delectable meals with whatever ingredients you want and avoid any ingredients you don't want, whether it's gluten or sugar or meat or whatever it was. So I bring my food a lot if I know I need to. Again, I know this is quite a general question, but uh, what are some of the food substances in your diet that give you the most feelings of satiety and, and of energy when you're working and you feel really you know, nourished and content afterwards? Grains, quinoa. Not everyone can do grains. My go-to is a quinoa bowl with all the veggies, as many colors as I can, whatever's in season or at the farmer's market or at my grocery store. And then I do liquid aminos, which are Bragg's liquid aminos. It tastes like soy sauce, but it doesn't have like the sugar and salt of soy sauce. So that's like a good go-to power up meal, you know, and then lots of superfoods. So I do a smoothie every day and I put maca and cacao and turmeric and all my protein powders. So that always gives me a good boost. That's great. And I'll learn more about that in my days as well before I'm going to the hospital or whatever. And I drink coffee too. So I'm not an anti-coffee person, but some people are. So 
do whatever you want. We'll do whatever works for you. All right, guys. Well, this has been so fun. Laura, tell everyone where they can find you online. Sure. So work on my sort of health and spiritual stuff is on healingpowers.net. And on the creative side, it's laurapowers.net. And I'm on Instagram at laurapowers44, Twitter at that laurapowers. And then you can find me on Facebook at Healing Powers. Perfect. And Samir, what about you? Uh, in terms of the food production we have, we're building our website at the moment, so it's not up, up and running. My email address that would be the best to contact me. If anybody has any ideas uh, or they have scripts, feature film scripts that they would like to share and develop into a feature film, I'd be so interested to read. It's, it's a little long, so bear with me, but it's my full name at hotmail.com. I'll give my Hotmail account. So it's... Um, S-A-M-I-R-S-R-I-V-A-S-T-A-V-A at hotmail.com. Amazing. What an amazing opportunity. Thank you. No, thank you for having me. I've absolutely enjoyed every moment of this. Oh, that's so sweet. Thanks for being here. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, developing a more positive outlook on life. In rare cases, people have experienced a strong desire to actually start using their $39.99 a month gym membership. If you experience any of these symptoms, Snapchat your trainer immediately. (laughs) 